Today's topic is Transcendental Skepticism, and I'm looking particularly at works that came in the aftermath of the clash between Ralph Waldo Emerson and Andrews Norton at the Harvard Divinity School in 1838 and 39. Some of the things that we'll be covering today were directly prompted by that clash. Other things were written around that time and continued to be influential in American discussions of special divine action. So some of these pieces will be more tightly linked in than others, but I'm trying to give you a sense of some of the major players, some of the authors that you may want to look at if this is a subject that you would like to pursue. Transcendental skepticism, again, is a United States movement centered particularly at Harvard, uh, sometimes known as New England Transcendentalism, and arose largely within the Unitarian camp and split that camp with some people carrying it more extreme. And some people actually left the Unitarian school altogether and just launched out on their own. Uh, it was heavily influenced by German skepticism and through that by Hume's anti-supernaturalism and Emerson is the most prominent person to have featured in it. So that's why we looked at his Divinity School address. I'd like to start by explaining what Andrews Norton's position was, because Norton had already published the first volume of his work on the gen genuineness of the Gospels a couple of years before he gave his Divinity School response to Emerson. Uh, a little background here may help. Norton had resigned his position at Harvard in 1830 to focus on his scholarly work, but he was still a powerful and influential figure in the intellectual life of the university. Norton's position was that Harvard had gone to the dogs, and it had done so largely because there was a governing body that was not composed of faculty. The governing body didn't know what was going on or what to do, and the students without faculty guidance and a strong faculty hand were an upstart bunch who didn't know what they were doing and were interrupting their own education. Some people have called Norton the Unitarian Pope, and that's a colorful appellation, but it is probably out of all scale to the influence he actually wielded. He might have liked to have had more influence, but his life history is a history of frustration with the university. In fact, when they asked him around 1840 to come back, he made some demands for faculty governance of the university, which they sat on and eventually turned down. So he never did go back to teaching at Harvard. His position is that of a uh, fairly conservative uh, Unitarian, but a liberal by the standards of old Princeton. The Synoptic Gospels, for example, are not free from errors, but they are the genuine and independent records of the events they report. You may wonder how that stacks up against the modern consensus that the Synoptics have literary dependence relations, uh, particularly with the Gospel of Mark, depending on the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Now, Norton gives a very interesting rejoinder to that kind of argument, which he anticipates. He says this is ruled out by the fact that Mark and Luke both diverge from Matthew, for example, in reporting only one demoniac, where in Matthew 8 we have two, or one blind man, where in Matthew 20 we have two. That is not a phenomenon that we can reconcile with their borrowing from Matthew. Conversely, of course, the modern position that uh, Mark came first and Matthew later would run into this question, why is Matthew doubling these things? So the, the Literary independence is something that Norton asserted between them. Now, he argues for this in the face of the verbal similarity of some passages among the synoptics. And the way that he does that is he breaks them down. This is a breakdown that you don't see done perhaps as often as it deserves to be done. He says, the words of Jesus, and in fact, direct discourse, are highly conserved. There's a great deal of verbal similarity. But as soon as you step outside of that to the narrative portions, looking at them in Greek, you find that the verbal similarity drops off dramatically. So his position was that the words of Jesus, and even words of other people, were preserved very carefully. 
but the stories were passed around orally with some freedom among those who knew what had happened who, and who had been there. It was only the direct quotation that was highly conserved. And he does some analysis of this in The Genuineness of the Gospels to argue this point. If they are independent, or even largely independent, then they must be approximately contemporaneous with one another because if one of them had been written long before the others, then the one that was written first must have been known to the authors of the much later documents, and in that case we wouldn't find the independence that we do find. The dating of Acts, which ends before the Paul gets word on what happens to him, must have happened before the Neronian persecution. This forces us to put the Gospels in the 60s. All of them approximately at the same time, and at least the Synoptic Gospels, and then this early dating makes it impossible to regard the miracles as legendary accretions. It's very difficult, Norton argues, to try to separate out the miraculous accounts from the narratives if they were in fact written that early within living memory of the crucifixion, within the lifetime of people who had been eyewitnesses to it, and as he would argue, by some who actually were eyewitnesses to it. Emerson's reaction to Norton was largely private and peeved, but he didn't make any attempt to engage with Norton in public. That was probably a wise move. Emerson was an eloquent man and a very fine speaker, but he was not Norton's equal as a scholar. Here's what he wrote in his journal in October of the year that Norton had given his rejoinder. It is a poor-spirited age. The great army of cowards who bellow and bully from their bedchamber windows have no confidence in truth or God. The feminine vehemence with which the A.N. of the Daily Advertiser beseeches the dear people to whip that naughty heretic is the natural feeling in the mind of whose religion is external. It cannot subsist. It suffers shipwreck if its faith is not confirmed by all surrounding persons. A believer, a mind whose faith is consciousness, is never disturbed because other persons do not yet see the fact which he sees. The aim of a true teacher now would be to bring men back to a trust in God and destroy before their eyes these idolatrous propositions, to teach the doctrine of perpetual revelation. The doctrine of perpetual revelation, quite an interesting phrase, but quite in keeping with Emerson's individualism. If Emerson himself was reluctant to engage in a written dispute with Norton, there were others who were willing to take up his cause. One of them was his friend George Ripley. Ripley was an American minister and journalist. He eventually left the Unitarian ministry, but was quite closely associated with Emerson and the Transcendentalist movement. There's a series of pamphlets that go back and forth between Ripley and Norton. Ripley initially publishing anonymously and then later coming out in his own name. Ripley's line of attack is largely to accuse Norton of an inadequate command of the German language and for his inadequate command of the German language uh, to have misrepresented Schleiermacher and other German thinkers. And so the reading is rather tedious as it goes through the question of what should be the proper rendering of this or that German phrase. And uh, Norton is taking none of it, lying down, so he's vehemently engaging with Ripley on all fronts. And if you are interested in the controversy, it is worthwhile just to take a look at those examinations the, that go back and forth between them on that subject. On Norton's side, there were a couple of very interesting people. John Gorham Palfrey, was a close friend of Norton and Norton's successor when Norton dropped out of the uh, teaching position at Harvard. John is looking at me as though he can't hear me. Okay. Palfrey was a theologian and a legislator, eventually a member of the U.S. House of Representatives for Massachusetts.
Uh, as a person, he was more tolerant of dissenting opinion than Norton. Some of his students record that in his lectures, he would give them a certain point of view, and if they disagreed, he would gravely ask them to lay out and substantiate their own view, and he would give them the opportunity to do that, and then he would say what he had to say, but commend their view to the careful consideration of the other students. So that's probably something Norton never did, just a very different personality, and yet he took substantially the same ground that Norton took. His position was not very different from Norton's position. Palfrey has a couple of interesting things to say with regard to Emerson. Late in his life, he wrote a book on preaching, and in the, that book he has this to say. I had, not long ago, an unsought conversation with a wise and devout layman, a constant and loving churchgoer, who said to me, The sermons of some of our brightest young ministers have no backbone, no vertebrae. They sound well, but when the sermon is over, I have no idea what the preacher has been driving at. There seems to me more truth in this than there ought to be. I have sometimes heard sermons that were mere series of aphorisms, more or less, generally less brilliant, Emerson set this fashion. And um, if we go back and we look at his diary, uh, sorry, that's, that's Peabody on this, and if we go back and we look at Palfrey's diary on this, Palfrey, who was one of Peabody's teachers, says, Emerson preached odiously at the hall in the evening. So this was the reception of Emerson by people who were not as fiery as Norton, but had a kind of a cool approach to him. Simon Greenleaf is a very important figure, and I wish that we had more time to devote to his work. He was an American lawyer and jurist, a specialist in the law of evidence. He joined Harvard Law School in 1833 before even taking his degree, and he was very influential in developing the law school and the law school library. In 1846, he published the first edition of An Examination of the Testimony of the Evangelists by the Rules of Evidence Administered in Courts of Justice. And in subsequent editions, the title varies a bit, but the substance of the work remains the same. The work is quite long, largely because it contains, pardon me, a uh, harmony of the Gospels in which various apparent discrepancies are treated, plausible reconciliations are offered. But the really important part of it, for our purposes and today for most purposes, lies in the initial address that he gives, and the study that he gives of how this kind of question, are the evangelists giving us truthful testimony, ought to be handled according to principles of law. He engages in the course of that with several things that we will recognize as we look it over. So, for example, on the relation of evidence to Christian belief, he says, For men of law to refuse to acquaint ourselves with the evidences of the Christian religion or to act as though, having fully examined, we lightly esteemed them, is to assume an appalling amount of responsibility. And again, the foundation of our religion is a basis of fact, the fact of the birth, ministry, miracles, death, resurrection by the evangelists as having actually occurred within their own personal knowledge. So this, again, is something that Norton would have understood and agreed with very much. Definitely not the slightest concession to the Emersonian wing, and Greenleaf must have been aware, writing in the 1840s, of the big controversy that had gone down in 37 and 38 at Harvard. Some of the most interesting parts of Greenleaf's discussion are found in long footnotes. Some of those footnotes involve quotations from other authors, but there's a very interesting one where he deals with Laplace. So here's what he says. Laplace, in his essay on probabilities, maintains that the more extraordinary the fact attested, the greater the probability of error or falsehood in the attester. Simple good sense, he says, suggests this, and the calculation of probabilities confirms its suggestion. There are some things, he adds, so extraordinary that nothing can balance their improbability. 
This argument has been made much use of to discredit the evidence of miracles and the truth of that divine religion which is attested by them. So here you can see Greenleaf has just been discussing Hume and has quoted a long passage from Lord Brougham in response to Hume. And then he turns to Laplace who's trying to put a mathematical cutting edge on Hume's skepticism. But he responds, however it sound it may be in one sense, this application of it is fallacious. The fallacy lies in the meaning affixed to the term extraordinary. If Laplace means a fact extraordinary under its existing circumstances and relations, that is, a fact remaining extraordinary notwithstanding all the circumstances, the position needs not here to be controverted. If something is all things considered extraordinary, improbable, well then it is improbable. But if the term means extraordinary in the abstract, improbable when considered apart from all of those circumstances that might seem to point to its truth, it is far from being universally true or affording a correct test of truth or rule of evidence. There are many things that seem incredible considered apart from their evidence, but quite credible when the evidence is brought in. The fallacy of Laplace's reasoning is the same as the fallacy of Hume's reasoning. He is considering antecedent improbability and leaving out of account or refusing to take into account the value of testimony. Again, I'll remind you of the interesting little story of the controversy Laplace got into with museum curators who were displaying meteorites or aerolites as they were called at the time, claiming that they were rocks that had fallen from the sky. Laplace's position was that there was absolutely no reason that rocks ought ever to fall from the sky, and as the people who were attesting to their having fallen were just ignorant peasants and not trained scientific men, it was completely unworthy of the museums to display these things and to take these folk tales of their origin as having any scientific merit, and he actually persuaded many of the museums to throw out their collections of meteorites. It's an interesting little side show in the whole history of uh, taking testimony seriously or not, depending on one's position. Another interesting figure uh, in the Unitarian movement is Stephen Greenleaf Bullfinch. The Greenleaf here uh, is taken from his grandfather, who was the sheriff of Exeter and Suffolk County, if I recall, not taken from Simon Greenleaf. Uh, he was the younger brother of Thomas Bullfinch, who became quite famous after his death. Uh, Thomas's lasting work was Bullfinch's Mythology, which was published posthumously. Uh, Stephen was not so well known, but outlived his brother by a few years. In his last years, he wrote two rather important works from our point of view, because they represent where the conservative side of the Unitarian movement had gone in the decades subsequent to Norton's clash with Emerson. One of them in 1866 is a very short manual of the evidences of Christianity. In 1869, he published another work, uh, independent work, called Studies in the Evidences of Christianity. That one is actually rather hard to find these days, but we either do or shortly will have a copy of that available in the library for you. Here's something that Bullfinch says in the former work, the manual, regarding the compatibility of miracle and science. A bird, which has always lived in a forest and has never seen a human being, finds on returning to seek its nest at night that the tree which bore it is prostrate, although there has been no storm. This is a miracle to the bird. It is out of the course of nature to which the bird has been accustomed. To us, it is no miracle. It is simply that a settler has cut down the tree. The interference, then, of a superior being or order of beings with an inferior may produce a miracle to the latter, yet it may be perfectly consistent with the laws of the superior being's nature. This kind of analysis of the nature of a miracle is a very interesting one, and you'll find it taken up later by people like John Venn in The Logic of Chance. The idea is that nature is a hierarchy. There is a stratification of levels of cause and influence, and when the higher influences interrupt 
the lower, those who know only the lower as the laws of nature, can give no account of what's going on. It seems to them incredible. Just in virtue of that fact, a report that such an interruption has taken place will seem to them to be extraordinary and perhaps not worthy of credit. But why? Because they are discounting the possibility of the existence of a cause capable of intervening in the course of nature. One of the charges that some skeptics had leveled against believers in miracles in the traditional sense was that miracles would be events without causes. That objection was common around the turn of the 19th century, though John Stuart Mill brushes it aside in his system of logic. He's not a believer in miracles, but he says, no, come, that's not really fair. The cause of the miracle is almighty power. A divinity surely may be conceived to have the power to bring about the effect. The question is whether, in fact, that has been done. And Mill was on the whole cynical and somewhat skeptical. Um, Bullfinch's approach here is designed to address that sort of criticism. We are not saying that a miracle is an event without a cause. It very much is an event with a cause. The cause, however, is a cause of which we have no other direct awareness. That's why its occurrence is so surprising and seems so extraordinary to us. So the true law of causality is not that every event is the inevitable outcome of previous physical causes. The true law of ca causality is that every event is the outcome of adequate causes, be they physical or supernatural. Bullfinch also has something very interesting to say about negative and positive evidence because he anticipates the objection that a skeptic is likely to make. It has been contended that all human experience testifies against miracles. Our individual experience can count for very little from the limited range of our observation, and the experience of ages past is known to us only by the testimony of those who then lived. Some of these, the sacred writers, expressly declare that miracles took place. Others are silent respecting them. But no one directly contradicts from his own knowledge the assertion of the sacred writers. Here, then, is only testimony against testimony, nay, testimony which is merely neutral against that which is positive. That distinction between negative and positive testimony is a distinction that's recognized in law. Uh, again, Starkey, Greenleaf, and other writers cover this kind of distinction. If I say that I was in a certain public place and a certain person was there and I conversed with him, and someone else testifies that he was also in that place that evening and did not see this person, my testimony will generally carry greater weight than the negative testimony of the other witness. The reason for this is that there are many ways for one person to overlook, to miss a fact. He might have been distracted, his attention might have been focused on something else. He might have momentarily stepped out of the room. My positive testimony cannot be explained in so many ways. Either I am lying or I am grossly deceived about a matter where it's hard to imagine how I could be deceived. I was talking with my friend, I know him well. Or the matter happened as I am testifying it. So for that reason, positive testimony and negative testimony are not weighed equally in courts of law. Bullfinch doesn't bring in the legal context, but someone like Greenleaf or Starkey certainly would. So. What he's saying here, to make it concrete, is that if we had testimony from members of the Sanhedrin who had been camped out a dozen yards from the door of the tomb in which Jesus had been buried and said that on the third day, nothing happened, the stone remained, no one had come in or out, they heard other people making a fuss and claiming to have seen Jesus, but they were there the whole time, that would have been direct positive evidence on the negative side. But the mere fact that they did not report having seen the risen Jesus is not significant evidence on their case. And then more generally, mere failure of people to report miracles at various times is not strong evidence against someone's report of it from positive and direct evidence.